Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AKA Hotel Residences Corman Communities, Aerial Property Advisors, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Mortgage Lending, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC, Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Ocean First Bank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, Stonehenge NYC, SVN CPEX Real Estate Services, Tierra CRG, the Meringo Family Foundation, and these friends. Hi, this is Mike Stoller of the Stoller Report here on a webinar sponsored by our friends at Amtrust Title, uh, Steve Napolitano, Senior Executive Vice President. And my guests today include two very quiet, outspoken individuals, Jeff Levine, who is the Chairman and CEO of Douglaston Development, Levine Builders and Clinton Management, and Ofer Yardeni, who is the Chairman and CEO and Founder of Stonehenge NYC. So, Here's the question today. How do we compare this to 9-11, after 9-11? Jeff, you were working on projects in lower Manhattan. Ophi, you were on some buildings. Where do you see this today as compared to 9-11? Obviously, uh, this is more of a long-term shock to everybody. 9-11, in the moments after the terrorist events, we all lived in great fear that even more was going to follow as the other events never occurred people got back to normal life it was almost considered to be the right thing to go out to restaurants to go out to theater to go out to ball games this recovery which will come is not going to be of that nature because once we've overcome even the immediate fear of the virus the long-term fear till we have a vaccine till we have medicines that can treat it properly are going to continue to have people frightened of social activity. So I think that this event, in terms of restaurants, hotels, airline traffic, will have a greater event. I think the general business of business, whether it's finance or our housing business, will ultimately get back quicker. Today they released the fact that in Wuhan it took 10 weeks for the city to be free. If we have a 10 week situation from you know the middle of March, we're into the middle of May or even later. How do you look at this on the New York City economy, on the residential market, on the businesses that you're involved with? Michael, we can't just look at it at the 10 weeks what happened in China. The people that are living in China, it's a completely different culture, a completely different way of running a country. But before we even we'll talk about the implication of how it will affect if we are going to stay all at home for uh, 10, 10 weeks or two months, I can tell you that after 9-11, uh, the country was in shock or after 2008, it was a financial crisis. But at least after 9-11, we knew who is the enemy. We knew that we can defend ourselves against the terrorists. Here, we don't know who is the enemy. 
We can't see the enemy. Everybody is working with fear, fear and anxiety that it's not just affecting the man, the businessman after 2008, it's affect kids, their parents, their grandparents, the families, the community. And I think it will take a longer time to recover because people will have to change a lot of their habits, as Jeff said, traveling with uh, uh, overseas on vacation, cruise line, going to uh, see shows, Broadway, the theaters, and even the way we communicate our, among ourselves and run our businesses, run our offices, and run all the activities in the city. I think it will take a long time for us to heal from this epidemic, especially when we don't know if it's coming back in September. I think that we as a world cannot sustain that kind of uh, lockout. But I think that if there is one country that will come stronger and better than any other part of the world is the United States. And as long as in the United States, the federal government and the local government will continue to support people, businesses, and if fueled the economy with capital, we will recover. And I expect the second quarter to be a disaster. People are saying that the GDP will drop 20, 25, 30%. Unemployment will double. Uh, maybe it will go to six, 7%. But hopefully, if this is a short term versus a long term, I still believe that once the recovery will happen, if it's the third quarter or the quarter, it will be as a V shape and the stock market will go back to its records and real estate that lags will improve because the fundamentals going to the, this crisis that from my point of view started Friday, uh, March 13, when my wife told me we are out of New York City, we are going to the Hamptons, that's the crisis started. I can tell you that until that day, unemployment was as the lowest as it can be. Stock market was high, debt was available, capital was available. So I think that we came to this crisis very, very strong. And with the help of the government, we will be even stronger. Both of you own significant amount of residential rental apartments. What's really happening? How many people are really paying the rent? You know, we're at April 7th. Some of the rents may have come in. What's really happening as opposed to the hype? It, very simply said, it really is a tale of two different worlds. Um, many of our electors talk about a tale of two cities. In our market rate portfolios, I am monitoring our collections. And remember, collections start in the first or the second of the month and continue virtually through the 15th. Many people pay through their credit card or click pay, and those come in pretty regularly. What we have acknowledged so far is that much to my relief, frankly, that we are achieving anywhere from 90 to 95% of our market rate rent collection on the days that we receive them in the previous months. Typically, the people who have more trouble paying aren't on uh, automatic pay, typically send in a check um, or wire the money, and the people who have more difficulty paying tend to pay towards the latter part of the period where it's due. So right now, I'm tracking at 90% to 95% in some cases of what our ordinary collection is, but I am anticipating that the rent, and we're at 75% collected, in the balance of 25%, which remains to be collected of our market rate portfolio, I am expecting the delinquencies to increase there. And we're taking great efforts in our market rate portfolio to reach out to our tenants, to let them know that we will continue to provide services. And I have to just take one moment, even though we're talking about the financial aspect, I have to you know, just salute all of our resident managers, our property managers, our doormen, our porters, all of our people who are going to work every day, albeit many of them are not in the high risk group, many of them are younger, many of them are healthy, but they are going every day, they are using PPE, they are taking special care of our buildings, they are dealing in some cases with residents who have the coronavirus, doing an incredible job of sanitizing all locations every day. And let's just talk about packaged locations. I think we all know with the younger millennials who are 
typically our tenants these days in New York City, they had been getting upwards of 20 and 30 packages per apartment a month. That coupled with food delivery has become a monumental job of servicing these buildings. So I thank the tenants who are paying and respecting the job that these people are doing. And I thank the people who are doing the job that they're doing. But then we get to the other spectrum, the other spectrum of residential meaning the affordable. In the affordable, collections come in slower. Typically through this time of the month, six or seven days into the month, if we are 35 or 40% collected, that's a good month. We are at 75% of that ordinary rate of collection. And that's where I fear that our rents will truly suffer. Because if you take a look at the people who occupy our affordable components, whether they be the affordable part of a New York State tax, New York City tax abated building, an 80-20 or 75-25, or just an outright agency subsidized development, either in the Bronx or in Brooklyn or even in Staten Island the real, and Queens, the reality is that those working people are the people of the restaurants, of the movies, of transportation, the cab drivers, who are essentially not doing business right now. And that is where we're seeing a tremendous gap in rent collection. Are tenants reaching out to you saying they'd like an abatement in their rent? What's happening with regard to that? Well, so absolutely. It's a very good question, but but I, I will answer you a little bit about the rent collection. Um, one, we have close to 3,000 units in the city, close to 5,000 tenants because few of our apartments, tenants are sharing apartment. And I can tell you that on uh, the fair market units, uh, most of our rent, uh, we collected already by the third of the month. Most of them pay by automatic pay. By, uh, in fact, they pay on March 31st. 15% of our tenants are students. So the lease is guaranteed by their parents. And you have in New York 600,000 students which is a great uh, tenant space to have. So we collected on the fair market uh, rents somewhere between 75 to 80 percent of our rents. Uh, let's not forget that the average unit, the average income per unit at the Stonehenge portfolio is around 240,000. They are all working either lawyers, accountants, they work in the, in the uh, many of them are working in the financial services, uh, uh, technology, and the kind of real estate that we run, we are very proud at the services that we provide. Nobody comes to live at the Stonehenge building because the rent is cheap, but they come to live because we offer the ability to live in a community. And in fact, in this crisis, even though so many companies cut the services of uh, uh, close the gyms or close other amenities, we as a company continue to provide the lifestyle services to our community where we are providing them online activities and help. So we are looking at it more as a community. With the rent stabilized, clearly we see that uh, it, they are slower payer. Uh, I would say that our collection right now are around 20, 25%. And the reason also is, is not that they didn't pay the rent. The rent stabilized, you are obligated to take a check. So until they write the check, if it's the second or the third, until the post office delivers, until we get it, it will take until the 10 to the 15. I am expecting that most of the tenants in New York will honor their obligation and will continue to pay rent. Clearly, we got several phone calls from people that had uh, COVID-19, some people that asked for financial assistance, some people asked that are self-employed that asked for a concession. And as a community, as a landlord, as a human being, we look at every request like that and analyze. Of course, we ask to see if they got fired. We ask to see if their earning change. We ask to check, we check to see how their life is being affected. And if their life is being affected, we are going to defer their payment. We are going to provide them help. And for example, in several of our buildings where the, we had the virus, we help the tenants because the tenants are not allowed to leave the apartment. We bring them food. 
we take their garbage, we check on them. So we try to work on it as a community. No one that lives in a Stonehenge building will suffer because of the COVID-19, because us as a landlord. We are right. in it together and we will help them. There are many good landlords. Unfortunately, the landlords of this city have unfortunately been cast in a negative light because of the illicit actions of just a few. I can tell you that I have been on the phone this past week, not only with landlords like Ophi Yardani, but with Hal Fenton, with David Pickett, with Ron Mollis, Don Kaposha, um, David Hudson, um, Lisa Pianco over at Blackstone, all of whom are working collectively and correctly to get through this problem. We are talking about how we can reach out to our tenants, expect those who can't afford to, to pay their rent as they should, and work with those who are having difficulty because they are furloughed or they are sick or whatever the case may be. And we have worked on formats where we have applications where those tenants can request in writing relief, but it has to be subject to being verified. And we are more than happy to do that because this is not a problem of their creation or our creation. It's a problem that our whole society is being subject to. And as human beings, we owe it to each other, both our tenants, our lenders, our vendors to work together till this virus passes and we can go back to life as we know it. Let's also think who are the tenants that got hurt the most right now. Different than 2008 where the financial crisis and Lehman Brothers overnight, Burr Stern, the biggest bank in America fell apart and the loss of employment was among the uh, guys that make from half a million to $10 million. What we see right now in the COVID-19 that the people who are being affected are people that are making from twenty-five to $60,000. Macy's closed down, Bloomingdale closed down, hotels are, are closed down, down. So all the waitress, all the people that are working in the hotel, uh, all the doormans, all the guys that work in the restaurants, all those all guys the, all laid the off. Environment, the entire service. All the service. So these kind of people that I feel terrible for them, they typically do not live in the building that Jeff and I manage and run in our portfolio. They are more in, I would say, Queens, Washington Heights, Harlem, the Bronx. And when I speak with my friends that own multifamilies there, it's devastating because the retail in these locations are closed, they're not paying rent. And the residential, even if they want to pay rent, they cannot afford to pay rent. They don't have the capital. So I think that crisis did not hit us yet. If things will continue to worsen, and you're talking about three months, four months of staying at home, and if suddenly Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley will start firing people, we are in a serious problem. Both of you are working remotely today. Your offices are working remotely. What effect do you think that COVID-19 is gonna have on the office leasing market? We spoke about this yeah. briefly together yesterday. Um, I've read that divorce actions are up as a result of this quarantining or social isolation, <laughs> not for Ofer and Shari or myself and my wife, Randy, but I think that I'm hearing both sides of the argument that offices are becoming a thing of the past, that Zoom and WebEx and GoToMeeting and Microsoft Team are all gonna take over the world and we're all gonna work remotely. All that having been said, yes, it's a wonderful tool, just the way the internet is a wonderful tool, but the fact of people getting together, of understanding each other, so we have to go to our buildings, we have to go to our construction sites, we have meetings where people have to collaborate, and yes, you can exchange information via the internet. But you, but you, you know what? We can have home telling. Yeah. You know, you, can, you don't have to come into the office every day. Michael, Michael, look, technology is definitely taking off. But I realized for the last three weeks that I love people. I, I enjoy being in the office. I enjoy running the company. I enjoy going to the building, talking to the tenants, and I'm enjoying sitting down with my staff and discussing a deal and how to acquire. It reminds me of the days in the army, like a unit, uh, 
a small unit that needs to go for an operation when you have a deal, it's the hunt. You can't have the same hunt and the same feeling over Zoom, it's a completely different. Now, it's true the technology change. It's true that I had 20,000 square feet and I, because of technology, I reduced my, my space to 15,000 square feet. It's true that I had a large office and today I sit with the ball pen with my guys. I'm not going to now shrink it even more. The fact that we can work on a, or remotely, it's great. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Maybe I will say to some uh, division in the company, Monday and Friday, you don't have to come to the office. You choose half of the division will work from home as long as you can be effect effective. Clearly, law, law firms can go and provide space to, to, to the lawyers to work from home. You can't work from the kitchen for a month because it's just impossible or I'm sitting in the living room. So the law firms are going to give more money to their employees and saying, furnish a section in your house so you can work comfortable and you can communicate. Accountants will tell their guys, work one day or two days at home. Yes, maybe they'll shrink some space, but the office space model is not disappearing. So, we are creature, we love people, we want to be with people. If you take Jeff and you tell him that he can have all the money in the world, the biggest boat in the world, and he cannot see anybody, he will jump to the water. I know <laughs> Jeff, he will be miserable. And part of the American culture is not just to make money, it's to show that you made the money. It okay. shows that uh, to your friends and to be with them. So I, I really believe people sometimes tend to, after two or three weeks to make huge decision, they say time will do itself. The office will work, some will work from home, and, and what, the technology what, you know, will we improve. Talking yesterday, both of you, and like Jeff to try to answer this question about the co-sharing of space, the WeWorks, the Yard, the Regis. What do you see with regard to that in the future? Well, I think you know, I was never a fan of co-working to the level that WeWork had taken it. Obviously, you had Regis for many years, and it was a rational business with rational numbers, and even it in a downturn went bankrupt and had to restructure itself. So it is a business that is necessary, just the way there are all kinds of restaurants, whether it's fast food and takeout, or it's fine dining or casual fast food, there are different types of offices. So there is a place for it. But I do not think that in the long term, a, a deal where a landlord can accept a high rate of pay without a long term commitment can survive through the vagaries of the economy. But I want to go back to something we talked about a moment ago. And Jeff, I disagree I with you a little bit about <laughs> on this note, so I'd like to respond okay. after you Please finish. Let, okay. him talk. Okay. Let me finish. So the next point that I want to make is I do own quite a few thousand affordable units that I had built essentially through the various city and state agency and, and programs. And recently in the Bronx, you recently built. Oh, we, ju we just did Crossroads over 500 units a wonderful facility. We just built a 200 unit facility for seniors in Staten Island. But my point is, this is the area where I think most attention has to be focused because as Ofer has said, the people who live in these buildings are working in fields that for the moment don't exist. Um, and therefore they are going to be the most rent challenge. The good news, the good news is that both the city and state have programs to help the residents of these affordable units when they come into difficulties. And the better news is I believe that many of the mortgages on these affordable projects were issued through city and state agencies, often through bonds. And those city and state agencies have already indicated a willingness to um, forbear mortgages for up to three or four months. Even New York Community Bank, if you read in the papers this week, is offering their private sector borrowers the opportunity to get forbearance. So yeah, most again, of the government assisted are giving a six month if it's a state or federal financing. So and let let me respond to Jeff about the we work and that concept. One, I personally love the concept of we work. Maybe I'll surprise you when I'm saying it. I didn't like the valuation of we work because I never thought it's 47 billion. Maybe I thought it's worth two to three, to four billion. 
but as the concept, think about it. Forget about the landlord. For the tenant, no security, move to a space, fully furnished, no lease, you have no, no, no uh, responsibility. By the way, if you talk about, you talked before about marriages, about the long-term commitment, if you think about short-term commitment, you can't have a better commitment than the we work. Jeff, we are moving, and we moved many years ago from the stability of, of home ownership to the flexibility of renting. The same thing is in the office building. If I can have a short term, no responsibility to be with people with good energy, it's fantastic. This is the future. The problem is the valuation. Instead of companies like WeWork, I believe that Essel Green, Silverstein, Tishman, the biggest landlords in New York, the Durst organization, and they will create their own co working environment and they will run in each building 10 to 30 thousand square feet of co-sharing today you cannot do an office building without providing those amenities today this is the norm not the exception so i think that the long term of a lease not for a car not for a home not for an office it's coming to our way sooner than we think we have to leave the conversation here, but we'll pick it up with much more on the second part of this webinar. Stay tuned and see you next week.